the Word of Faith Netcast is on the air. Well, praise God, it's time for another Word of Faith Netcast. This is Dr. Bill Bailey, and this is the Word of Faith Netcast. I'm glad you could join us as we get into the Word of God once again this week. We've had two weeks over the past uh, couple of weeks we've been talking about you got to get out of the boat from uh, Faith and Victory Church, a uh, message that I taught there. We're going to go back into teaching right here live in the studio. So uh, we're going to just go get your Bible and get ready. It's going to be a good time in the Word of God. Amen. So we want to uh, talk about a couple of things, that, some announcements you might say here at the top of the uh, netcast. One is that we have an opportunity that I don't know if you'll be interested in or not, but I'll put it out there. And that is we can do uh, programs live right over the Internet. Now, of course, this is recorded and uh, I go back and edit it and put in a lot of other stuff uh, afterward, graphics and so forth, uh, text and all that at the lower third of the screen. But we could actually do a live program. We've got the technology now to do that. If you would be interested in that, go ahead and write me at this address right here, Dr. Bill at WFM.org. I'd be, I'd be interested in hearing whether you'd be interested in a live show like that. So. Um, you know, just think about it. Uh, you can check out ustream.tv, the letter U, then the word stream.tv. Uh, that's the technology we'd be using, some live shows that we put out there. So uh, just let me know. And uh, I, I'm curious to see if there's interest in that. All right. Let's get into the Word of God. We're going to go into uh, my copy here of eSword. We're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, look at some scripture here that I believe will be a blessing to you. Let's go down to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 15. Let's start in 15. I'm, I'm always tempted to start a little higher up, but uh, we'll start in 15 because that's the area that I want to get into. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I love this scripture. I have quoted this scripture for many, many years. When I was just a boy in the Southern Baptist Church, I came across this scripture and I thought, boy, that really speaks to what I want to do. I want to study the word of God. Because I read this word study, S-T-U-D-Y, study, as studying the word. Well, it's actually, if you look into the Greek, it's actually better translated uh, a little differently than just the word study. And uh, if you check it out, it is the Greek word spudadzo. Don't you love Greek words? <laughs> spudadzo. It means to use speed to make an effort to be prompt or to be earnest. So earnest is probably a better word here, better phrase. And if we say it that way, be earnest to show thyself approved unto God. Well, what about this word study? Where did that come from in the King James? Well, it's a King James term. And uh, if you've ever watched that, uh, this is a funny uh, reference, but it's true. If you've ever watched the Beverly Hillbillies, <laughs> where they were speaking in, in old country expressions, a lot of those country expressions came from King James English. And, you know, back in the hills, they still spoke with that King James terminology. And so they'd say things like, you know, I'm a studying on it. What they meant is they're applying themselves. They're being earnest. You know, uh, let me study on that. That kind of phrase. You know what I'm saying? That means to be earnest. Not study as in pick up a book and open it up and study. But I think by law of double reference here, <laughs> we can apply that to it because being earnest in the Word of God, being determined to show yourself approved unto God is going to involve study of the Word. So like I said, when I was a young Baptist boy, uh, just coming up, I got into studying the Word at length and uh, I would quote this scripture, I'm studying to show myself approved unto God. Well, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that and that is part of uh, 
being earnest to show yourself approved unto God. But it's much more to it than that. So let's, let's look at it that way. Study or be earnest to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. Now that's a key point right there. You are a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now this is where the study of the word and the earnestness in the word, I believe, comes in. To rightly divide the word of truth. Now what's the implication to rightly dividing the word of truth? Well, it means that you could wrongly divide the word of truth. You could take the word of God and misquote it, misuse it, take scripture out of context, and there are people doing that today. Think about that. There are people doing that today. You say, well, Dr. Bill, that's no surprise. People have been doing that throughout all the years. Yes, but I believe there is an increase, and the Bible bears this out, there's an increase in false teaching in these last days. So we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then he gets into this a little more in detail. You see, there were false doctrines being preached even in Paul's day when he told Timothy that he needed to study to show himself approved. Amen? So let's look at what how they dealt with it. I think what you're going to find here is that it's very interesting how Paul, writing to a young pastor, Timothy was a young pastor, and a protege of Paul's, what Paul said to him concerning false doctrine in the church. Now this is an elder uh, apostle, in the case of Paul, speaking to a young pastor of a local church, and he gave him this counsel, study to show yourself approved. But now notice what he said, verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they increase into more ungodliness. Shun or refuse profane, now the word profane there, carries with it a meaning. Matter of fact, I'm going to actually look up the Greek uh, just to be 100% sure that we're, we're getting the, the actual meaning of this. Uh, let's look at verse, here we go, 16. I know what I need to do. I need to scroll down a bit here so I can see it. Uh, verse 16, in the Greek, the word profane is bebelos. Uh, it means accessible by crossing the doorway, by implication of Jewish notions, heathenish or wicked profane. Now the reason they use that example is that in Jewish culture, it was profane, it was wicked for a heathen to enter into the home of a Jew. In other words, they were not allowed to have the heathen, the non-believer, the non-Jew, uh, come into their homes. So that was considered a profane thing. Okay. Now, he's saying here that in the same way, we should shun profane babblings. Now, I really like the way he says it, profane babblings, vain babblings, empty sound is the meaning of the Greek word here. Kenovonia is the Greek word. It means empty sounding or fruitless discussion. There are a lot of fruitless discussions that people have. Now, I've heard a few of those, particularly out away from the church. Let's just be honest. <laughs> people get to talking about, well, it's what I believe. Oh my goodness, has nothing to do with the Word of God, has nothing to do with being sound doctrine, it's just one person's opinion, or maybe what one person told another person that told another person and on down the line has absolutely nothing to do with the Word of God. They are profane, heathenistic, unscriptural, vain babblings. <laughs> and what does it say to do with those? What is his counsel? to this young pastor. He says shun, which means to 
avoid, to completely do away with profane and vain babblings. Why? It says, for they will increase unto more ungodliness or impiety is the meaning of the Greek word here. In other words, if you want to be pious, that is, be have your uh, life and heart and spirit directed toward God, this would be contrary to it to engage in profane and vain babblings to listen to heathen. Let me give you a good example. If you flip on the TV and go to a cable news channel and hear some commentator talking about what the Bible has to say, <laughs> My goodness, it's profane and vain babblings. It's just heathenistic talk. There are people today that are trying to justify, for instance, quote, homosexual marriage. Well, marriage, by definition, is the marital union between a man and a woman. That's the definition. And yet they'll come out and say, well, you know, I don't think the Bible would say anything against uh, two men getting married. Oh, really? <laughs> Have you read Romans chapter 1? I mean, just, just open up and read Romans chapter 1. I don't have to make any commentary whatsoever. You can just read it for yourself, and then you'd know what the Bible has to say. But I've literally seen commentators that say, well, you know, I'm sure uh, there's nothing wrong with that as far as the Bible's concerned. Well, they don't know. It's just heathen, vain babblings. And that's what we're talking about. If you listen to that, if you give yourself over to that, you open yourself up to impiety or not having a heart directed toward God, right toward God. And so therefore you put yourself in a position that you are likely to become more and more unspiritual rather than being more spiritually directed toward God. All right, let's keep reading here. Uh, because I want you to see how Paul spoke to this young pastor about how to deal with these things. In verse 17, And their word will eat as doth a canker. Now that's an interesting phrase, kind of harsh <laughs> by today's standards, but still it's true. Their words, these impious, heathenistic, vain babblings, these incorrect things that are not rightly dividing the word of God, they will eat as doth a canker. They will destroy your spiritual life. That's how serious he is about it. But now here's what I want you to see. He goes on to say, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus? Now I want you to think about what he just did here. He named them by name. He told Timothy, here's two examples, two per people that I know are speaking vain, unscriptural things that you need to avoid what they're saying. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Look what he says about them. These two people who concerning the truth have erred. Concerning the truth. The word truth here is our old Greek word we've read so many times, aletheia. It means truth, verity. It is absolute truth. That would be the word of God because that same word is used in John 17, 17 when Jesus said, Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God is truth. So, concerning the word of truth, they have erred. These two people. Saying that the resurrection is past already. In other words, these folks were teaching that the resurrection at the last day had already occurred. Well, obviously, it hadn't. But they were teaching that. And look at the result of their teaching. They taught that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Some people had heard these people teach and their faith was overthrown. Their faith was damaged. Now, I know some people in the recent mess about putting a date on the rapture and the date came and went and the rapture didn't happen. I know some people that literally got to the point that they were having trouble sleeping, they were having problems at home with their family, and they were emotionally overwrought 
because they believed that the rapture was going to come. Well, you know, if they're Christians, if the rapture came, that's a good thing. I don't know why they were upset. But even so, the whole thing was false doctrine. The whole thing was incorrect. The Word of God tells us very plainly, no man can know the day or the hour. Jesus doesn't even know the day or the hour, only it's left to the Father God. So we certainly don't know the day and the hour. We know that the time's getting closer. We know that we need to live as if it were going to happen in the next few minutes, but not get overwrought and upset about it if it did happen right now. We just go be with the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's great. So anyway, the point is it damaged the faith of some people. Because they look back now and say, well, this guy said that the rapture was supposed to happen on this particular date, and it didn't. Then how can we trust anything in the Bible? Well, first of all, some knucklehead that says that he knows the date is not the Bible. <laughs> I mean, I can't think of any way to put it clearer than that. It's just not Bible, okay? It is vain, profane babbling. And there's a lot of doctrines like that that are going around right now. But I, I, I'm trying to make a point. Let's stick with the flow here. Who concerning the truth they have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Oh, praise God, I love that. The foundation of God standeth sure. What these profane, vain babblings have said, what these guys who have erred from the truth have said, what this knucklehead that talked about the rapture said, none of that disturbs the solid foundation of God. God is not one whit disturbed over this stuff. He goes on to say, The foundation of God standeth sure, solid and stable. Stereos in the Greek. Stiff, solid, stable, strong, sure. Whew, good words. Amen. Having this seal, the Lord, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, see, he's talking about two people that he's named specifically. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor, and some to dishonor. Now, a lot of people read the scripture, and I've seen them do it many times before, and they say, yeah, there are some vessels of wood, and I'm just one of those vessels of wood. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm, I'm just an old vessel of wood, rather than a vessel of honor. And there's going to be some in the house, you know, so I guess I'm just one of those. Now, wait a minute. Look what it says. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man, this is verse 21, very next verse, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Do you want to be gold and silver? Then purge yourself of the junk. Purge yourself of hearing vain, profane babblings. Purge yourself from listening to people that are teaching contrary to the word of God. And then you can be a vessel and honor. It's entirely up to you. You can make that decision. You can be a vessel and honor, sanctified, that is set apart, made holy, and meet or able to be used by the master. Meet for the master's use is the way the King James says it. But able to be used by God. Prepared unto every good work. So it's entirely up to you, and that's the point I wanted you to see from this. First of all, what did the elder statesman Paul do for this young pastor? He told him straight up, there are people teaching doctrine contrary to the word of God. And oh, by the way, their names are, and he named them by name. Now there's a lot of folks today that they shy away from naming people by name. But I tell you what. If you are a minister, and you have a minister that you are mentoring, there is nothing wrong with you telling them straight, 
this guy, Reverend so-and-so that you saw on TV, he's teaching error. He's teaching things that are not sound doctrine. You need to shun that, avoid that, refuse that. Don't watch him, don't listen to him, don't get his tapes, don't get his CDs, don't get his MP3s, whatever. Stay away from that. That is false doctrine. And be just that bold, just that precise, just that clear that you need to stay away from it. Now, should you get up from the pulpit and preach against those individual people? Well, now that is something between you and the Lord. If you're the pastor of a local church and you know somebody is teaching false doctrine and you tell the congregation to watch and shun and avoid that doctrine and that particular teacher, I'd say that is a very sound thing that you can do. But I'd be very, very sure that that's what they're doing, is teaching things that are not sound doctrine, that are not literally correct from the Word of God. Don't catch yourself coming against an individual just because you don't like their style, just because you don't like their method of delivery, but they're really preaching the Word. That's a whole other thing, okay? So you need to be seriously praying about that because that's you know don't judge another man's servant that's scriptural as well don't judge another man's servant but you say well Dr. Bill isn't this judging a servant isn't this judging a minister no what we're doing here is we're judging the doctrine the doctrine can be compared to the Bible and see what it says and then you know whether it's right or wrong. Now, let's keep reading, and I'll show you just what this is what this is talking about. Verse 22, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, uh, peace, and with them that call upon the Lord out of a pure heart, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt or able to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. These folks are opposing themselves. We'll get into that in just a minute, but I'm trying to get to a particular point here. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, they can repent and they can acknowledge the truth of the word of God. And then verse 26 says, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. People who teach false doctrine are taken captive by the devil at his will, but they, those individuals, can recover themselves out of that trap of the devil. See, as I've said many times before, Satan does not have ultimate absolute power that he can do anything he wants to do. He has only the ability, it's an ability, not a power, to deceive. And if he deceives and they are following false doctrine, then they are ensnared by the devil, but they can, it says, recover themselves out of the snare of the devil because they acknowledge the truth of the Word of God. And if they get up from their pulpit and they say, you know, what I was teaching, I was totally wrong. Everything I was saying was wrong. But I've gotten into the Word of God, I now acknowledge the truth of the Word of God, and I'm going to teach the Word of God. Well, praise God, they've recovered themselves out of the snare of the devil. They've made themselves that they're no longer a vessel of dishonor. Now they're a vessel of honor, gold and silver, praise God. And they're useful for the Master's use. Do you see what we're saying here? Uh, praise God, we're going to get into this a little bit further. I want to get into these scriptures that I kind of went over quickly and get into a little more detail on them. We'll do that next time. In the meantime, you can write us here at Word of Faith Ministries, our address, Word of Faith Ministries, P.O. Box 5213-5213, High Point, North Carolina, the zip code 27262. You can also write me at my email address. It's always quicker to write me via email, and that is drbill, D-R-B-I-L-L, at wfm.org. Join us next time, and remember until then to fulfill the Word of God.
The Word of Faith Netcast is brought to you by Word of Faith Ministries and our partners around the world.